Welcome to session seven, Waiting for Friendships. It's hard to believe we're already on session seven. It's crazy. We just have one more week to go. Um, so if you open to page 229 in your books for the outline. And um, as you're turning there, just sort of in- introduce this topic of friendship. Um, sometimes it seems funny in a, in a room full of women in our... I'm sure most of us are in our early 30s. Um, I'm sure I'm abnormal. My, <laughs> my early 40s. Uh, but this topic of friendship is still an important one. I mean, no matter how old we get as women, it's just friends, right? Um, and it's, it's not something that's talked about at the adult level very often. But I find that I am still regularly in need of counsel on friendship and wisdom in this area. And it's an area that I'm still waiting on, you know, waiting on to just as we move in and out of seasons in life with children and and with marriage or with jobs or changing or moving cities or whatever it is, um, just waiting for waiting for friends and waiting to be a good friend you know it's like you're just waiting to finally grow up and mature and be that kind of woman that always handles things responsibly and maturely and wisely Um, and there's never a season when we're not in need of friendships and particularly as women i think there's never a season where we're not waiting in one friendship or another for healing or for redemption or for forgiveness or whatever it is so um and if you're like me, you can rattle off who your best friend was um, in every grade from kindergarten to 12th. You know, how you became friends and why you're still friends or why you're not. And, um, and our friendships define us in so many ways. So, and nothing can make me act like a little girl faster than friendship in an area with a friend um, or a fear with a friend. And while it does get better with age, it's, it's, off, it's just good to kind of step, take a step back and, and examine, you know, what kind of friend really are we? And what role does friendship play in our life? Is it too much of a, is it, does it have too much of a focus or does it not have enough of a focus? And um, how have we grown? Because friendship is vastly important. And it's one of those subjects in the Bible that maybe it doesn't just come out and say, you know, it's just real black and white, but it's all, it's there in between the lines from Genesis to Revelation. So um, I want to look at sort of the importance of friendship and the model of two, true friendship and how we can kind of go awry and then how we can get back on track. So um, let's start today by looking at why friendship is important. I think sometimes as, as women, especially in the busy seasons of life, we can think real friendship with real women is too hard or is just a myth. And we want to throw in the towel and go live in like a small Texas town or on a desert island or something. And I just want to today talk about, is friendship something that we really need? And is it worth fighting for? Is it worth fighting for? So on your outline, the first thing under the importance of friendship in the English language, while we have one word for love, the ancient Greeks had at least three words for love that translate as phileo, eros, and agape. Phileo, meaning friendship, eros, romantic, and agape, Christianity really took this word over and, and kind of defined it as this selfless, unconditional, like covenantal love that comes directly from God. And then on your outline, in modern times, eros, or romantic love, has taken precedent as the highest form of love, which is not hard to see, right? You don't have to look very far to see examples of that. And phileo is the least necessary of the loves in our postmodern age and in the modern age. And that really started around the time of the Romantics and individualism. Um, And all you have to do is you look at Books, you know, best-selling books and movies and Taylor Swift's lyrics to her songs are not about my best friend. Um, They're about her relationships and shaking on, moving on. Um, Fashion, okay, lifestyle. I mean, it is all about eros. 
And, uh, but, but, and this is on your outline, in ancient times and in medieval times, friendship was the most exalted of the loves. Friendship. And it was the most exalted lo- of the loves because it was the most ascetic and world-renouncing. It was the most independent of mere nature. The Spartans, the Greeks, the Knights of the Round Table, Sir, you know, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. If you, again, if you go back and look at the literature and look at their art <coughs> and, and sort of the heroes and how the archetypes and how things were defined, so much of it was about friendship. Robin Hood, Canterbury Tales, they're a group of pilgrims traveling along, telling stories to each other. They're, it's not a married couple or two singles, right, looking for love. Um, so in his excellent book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis says this, and I'm going to read quite a bit from this book um, in the beginning part of this talk, but it is, the whole book is great, The Four Loves, but he, he uh, has a section on phileo or friendship. And um, so this is what he says. To the ancients, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves, the crown of life and the school of virtue. The modern world, in comparison, ignores it. We admit, of course, that besides a wife and family, a person needs a few friends. But the very tone of the admission and the sort of acquaintanceships which those who make it would describe as friendships <coughs> show clearly that what they are talking about has very little to do with that philea which Aristotle classified among the virtues or which Cicero wrote a book. It is something quite marginal, not a main course in life's banquet, a diversion, something that fills up the chinks of one's time. How has this come about? And the first reason that Lewis gives after this is Few value it, meaning friendship, because few experience it. Few value it because few experience it. Particularly now. I mean, increasingly. I should say increasingly so, right? We live in an age where we want to show ourselves off rather than lay our lives down. And friendship means how many followers do I have as opposed to who am I following? Who can I lay my life down for? And there's no friendship unless you approach it that way. So friendship is really becoming sort of a dying creature when you start looking at it culturally and you start looking at it in context of how young people are use social media and and enter into friendship. Who can follow me? How can I be famous? Those are really bad ways to be a good friend, right? And the second reason Lewis gives is because friendship is the least natural of the loves. There's nothing that quickens your pulse or turns you red like about friendship, like romantic love. And it's not in, instinctive or bi- organic or biological like parental love. So friendship can be hard work. It's difficult because it has the least to do with self. You have to get outside of yourself to experience true friendship and focus on another person with the risk of get, gaining no benefit for yourself, unlike with a spouse or a child. So in one way, it's sort of a relief. You're like, that's why friendship's so hard, you know? But when you think about it, there it, it is, it's the least natural. Because we have to completely, that's why Jesus says in John 15, greater love hath no man in this than he lay down his life for his friends. Okay, lay down your life for your child, of course, of course. I mean, even your spouse. I mean, some of us in here would be like, yes, and some of us would be like, no. <laughs> um, hopefully, yes, would be the predominant answer. But, but friends... It's the least natural thing in us. It goes against our nature, our sin nature. And that's the danger with friendship is that we want to make it about ourself. When scripture makes it clear in the way God made us, it's really about another. We, we grasp and we're greedy and we want to possess in our fallen nature. And that's why everything goes crashing down. And that's why true friendship is so rare. We have to sacrifice time and possessions, and emotional energy with the most risk of no return. But, so this is all the bad news, but there's good news. True friendship is not icing on the top in life. It's more than that. It's essential, and it's woven into the very fabric of the Godhead. Therefore, it's woven into our makeup too. So let's turn to Proverbs chapter 8, and this is one of my favorite um, chapters in all of Scripture.
Proverbs chapter 8. We're going to read verse 12, and then we're going to look at verses 22 through 36. Proverbs 8, 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. And then we're going to skip to verse 22. So verse 12 lets us know that wisdom is speaking here. Wisdom is being personified. The Lord possessed me, wisdom, at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. From everlasting I was established, from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundary, so that the water should not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. Now, therefore, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are they who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who sins against me injures himself. All those who hate me love death. What we see, so this is wisdom personified, speaking, and it's kind of like the the curtains are drawn back and we get to glimpse what was going on during the work of creation. This is wisdom as God's partner, so to speak, in the making of the world. And what we see is that the universe was established through two things, wisdom and friendship. But wisdom here is personified is the second person of the Trinity. This is Christ himself. And we know this because Colossians 2, 2 through 3 says, Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And other places in scripture, like in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, when he says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. That was something that rabbis or sages would have said. They would never have said, come to me and I will give you rest. They would have said, Come and listen to these teachings, right? Come and learn of the ancient way. But what Jesus did continually was he invited people to come to himself, that in him were the treasures of wisdom. He is wisdom, personified. And so what we see here in Proverbs 8 is this unique glimpse of Christ himself speaking, kind of showing us what was happening um, within the Trinity as the universe is being created, which is so cool. So look at verses 30 through 31. And on your outline, verses 30 through 31 says, I was beside him as a master workman. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of men. And this is on your outline. Friendship within the Trinity was the joy through which the universe was established. And if wisdom and friendship were the medium through which the world was founded, they will also be how you and I live well within it. Friendship within the Trinity was the joy through which the universe was established. I was daily his delight. I was beside him as a master workman, rejoicing always. There's this beautiful picture in Genesis 1 tells us the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we get this full picture of the Trinity involved in creation. And the universe, they weren't like, uh, we got to create something. I mean, the universe came out of their delight within one another, this friendship within the Trinity. And if wisdom and friendship were the medium through which the world was founded, they're also going to be how you and I live well within it. We will not know how to walk well through the universe, through creation, in our relationships, if we don't walk with wisdom and with friendship. We go back. If we want to know how to live well here on earth, we go back to the original pattern. And what's such a blessing and what I love is we're not left alone to figure out how to do this. How do we walk in wisdom? How do we walk in friendship? 
It was modeled and carried out for us here on earth when the second member of the Trinity took on flesh, right? John 1, 14 says, but the word became flesh, wisdom became <coughs> flesh and dwelled among us. He modeled for us how to live in perfect friendship with the Father and then in perfect friendship with others. And he could have carried out his mission as a lone ranger when you think about it. I mean, he was God, right? And it would have been vastly easier and less relationally exhausting. But he purposely chose 12 friends and then three intimate close friends, one of whom cared for his mother when he died. And out of those 12 friends, one betrayed him unto death, one denied him in his greatest hour of need, and they all abandoned him and ran away in the garden out of fear. No one stood with him. Yet, despite all that and knowing that, he still took the risk and the reward and the sacrifice necessary to have friends. And then he made them all new, with the exception of Judas, right? After the resurrection. And as we look at Christ, the second member of the Trinity, the more we walk with him, the more we know him, the longer time that we spend with him, the more we'll be able to walk in the wisdom of friendship with him and then with others that's necessary and life-giving to know how to walk well through life. And so that's the encouragement. Tim Keller says this. He has an excellent series on wisdom and on the book of Proverbs, if you want to listen to it. And that he actually just came out with um, a, a yearly devotional on wisdom, which I cannot wait to, to read starting in January. But he says this. God didn't send us an airtight argument. He sent us an airtight person. Isn't that beautiful? He sent us an airtight person, which is so much better than an argument, which is so much better than an airtight list of rules. He sent us an airtight person who walked through life perfectly. And Hebrews tells us, therefore, because he had to learn obedience through the things he suffered, he knows how to walk beside you in whatever situation you are in and strengthen you from the inside out. We don't get a, a pillar of cloud by day or fire by night, although sometimes I think I, I would prefer that, right? That would be really nice. Just show me where to go. When really, that didn't help the Israelites at all. They were horribly sinful. They were horribly disobedient. We get it. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away because then my spirit will come, the counselor, who will guide you in truth in all things. We have wisdom who resides in us from the inside out who lived life perfectly here, who was betrayed by friends, who invested in friends, who knew how important friendship was and decided I'm not going to do life or ministry without them and therefore knows how to perfectly instruct us as we walk along this way. So let's look at the model of true friendship that's based on the life of Christ, that's laid out for us in scripture as being necessary and that's articulated really well by C.S. Lewis. Thank goodness for C.S. Lewis. So I'm going to use him quite a bit in this section. And he was a scholar, a professor, and an expert on friendship he, because he was a professor of medieval literature at Oxford and Cambridge. And, um, you know, in medieval times, friendship was the most prized of all the loves. So, so much of the literature, so much of the thought was directed around friendship. And he was a good friend himself. He spent most of his life as a bachelor, and friendships were very important to him. He was part of a group called the Inklings, and they met weekly in a pub at Oxford called the Eagle and Child um, in a back room or in Lewis's rooms in the university. And they would discuss their works that they were working on, and they would go on long walks together, and they did all kinds of life together. Um, and this group consisted of Lewis and Tolkien, and Lewis's brother, Warren, um, Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, others, these great names. And some of the novels that were first read to this group, they would, you know, bring their novels and read to each other and bounce ideas off. Lord of the Rings, Out of the Silent Planet, Parts of the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, so these were a wonderful group of friends where he played out, he lived out what he's writing about here. So look on your outline, the definition of friendship. This comes from The Four Loves by Lewis. Lewis says this, Lovers are normally face-to-face, -face, absorbed in each other. Friends, side-by-side, -side, absorbed in some common interest. Friends are side-by-side, -side, absorbed in some common interest. And we're going to role-play in a minute and um, have some fun. But I want to get this shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder 
side-by-side -side image fixed in our minds because there are four things that come out of this definition. And when you start having friendships that go awry or you start feeling just off, you know, step back and think about this image. Am I playing out friendship in my life side by side, absorbed in some common interest? Or am, am I starting to turn inward or to another friend, right? Like this. And we're going to talk about what that means more in a minute. But number one in your outline, four things that come out of this side by side definition. Friends look at a common interest. Friends look at a common interest. Lewis writes this. Friendship arises out of near companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest or even taste which the others do not share and which till that moment each believed to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what, you two? I thought I was the only one. It may be a common religion, common studies, a common profession, even a common recreation. All who share it will be our companions, but one or two or three who share something more will be our friends. And this kind of love, as Emerson said, do you love me means, do you see the same truth? Or at least, do you care about the same truth? So friendship is always about something that's outside of yourself. And that's really tough for us as self-absorbed creatures, particularly women, right? Because we tend to be so introspective or self-absorbed. Um, and this interest that's outside of us can be good or bad, okay? It can be good, like good books or um, exercise or uh, your love of Jesus or tennis or Bible translation, or it could be a bad thing, like two kids at Columbine, right? Or weapons or violence or gossip about another person over a lunch table. You both dislike the same person or the same thing in your, the same teacher um, as a parent, right? So, but it's about, friendship is always about something outside of yourself. And then Lewis says this, that is why those pathetic people who simply want friends can never make any. The very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Where the truthful answer to the question, do you see the same truth, would be, I see nothing and I don't care about the truth, I only want a friend, no friendship can arise, though affection, of course, may. There would be nothing for the friendship to be about, and friendship must be about something, even if it were only an enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. So if you want a friend, pick an interest or a passion outside of yourself to focus upon, right? And friends will come. He says, if at the outset we had attended more to him and less to the thing our friendship is about, we should not have come to know or love our friends so well. You will not find the warrior, the poet, the philosopher, or the Christian by staring in his eyes as if he were your mistress. Better fight beside him, read with him, argue with him, pray with him. I love that. Serve outside of yourself. Play, laugh, uh, have fun outside of yourself with that person. Don't just make it about staring into one another's eyes over a cup of coffee or lunch, right? Make it about something outside of your own individual relationship. I think that's part of what um, sort of galvanized our city and even friendships with when the hurricane hit. All of a sudden, we were all side by side, focused on a common interest and a common goal. And you, you found this deep affection and love and friendship with these people you were tearing sheetrock out with and wading into houses with and ripping up carpet with, right? Because you, we were all focused on something outside of ourselves, which has this unique ability then to deepen your friendship and affection for each other. I so wish I had known this or could have believed this in junior high or high school or college or my, you know, all through my 20s, right? This is such a good reminder for those of us too with, 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 with children. Help them and encourage them to focus on other things besides the desire to have a friend or to be a friend. Help them to be focused on becoming who God created them to be and friends will come, Right? A spouse will come because when a friend comes, you want to be a friend worth having, an interesting friend. I love what he says. Those who are going nowhere have no fellow travelers. 
And sometimes I think we believe the lie and our, our children believe the lie that we have to just focus, just focus on friends. I, I need friends. I want to be a friend. I want to ha- and I can do that same thing too. And God's like, look, live, be who, you're, who I've called you to be. And I will bring you the fellow travelers and the companions that you need side by side along the way to fight with, to pray, meaning fight like, not argue, fight, but um, to advance the kingdom with, to pray with, to love with, to laugh with. I will bring you, you focus on becoming the woman I've called you to be. And the the friendships will come. Number two, this side-by-side image. Friends, it promotes the concept that friends are not jealous. Friends are not jealous. Lewis says this, in each of my friends, there is something that only some other friend can fully bring out. By myself, I am not large enough to call the whole person into activity. I want other lights than my own to show all his facets. Now that Charles is dead, I shall never again see Ronald's reaction to a specifically Caroline joke. Far from having more of Ronald, Having him to myself, now that Charles is away, I have less of Ronald. Hence, true friendship is the least jealous of all loves. Oh, were that true, right? In our hearts. Two friends delight to be joined by a third, and three by a fourth, if only the newcomer is qualified to become a real friend. They can then say, as the blessed souls say in Dante, here comes one who will augment our loves. For in friendship, to divide is not to take away. To divide is not to take away. We need, so what Lewis is saying is this, we need each other or our friends to call the whole person into activity. By excluding someone from the group, we don't have more of our friend, we have less of our friend. Because that person is going to bring out things in our friend that we would never see if that person wasn't there. This is such a strong temptation in women, isn't it? We want to hoard for ourselves. And I'm not saying there are, there are only so many friendships you can maintain or manage at one time, but if it's coming out of a a, a jealousy an envy, a, a, um, a desire to control or have for yourself, then you know that kills life. That doesn't bring it. And so we have to, as women, wean ourselves off of our junior high and fleshly models and and frankly satanic models and rather than kill life invite life in and model that um for our for our girls especially too um and and it's learning to see there's a divine rhythm and timing we were talking about this this morning there's a divine rhythm and timing to friendships that we have to relinquish to the lord and be okay with there are going to be seasons where he he, people go out of our lives and there are going to be seasons where he brings people in and just letting go more and more and, and not being jealous and saying, Lord, you are in control. I don't have to maintain. I don't have to control. I don't have to manage. I'm going to let you and your divine timing and your rhythm bring people in and out of my life as you see fit. The third thing that comes out of this side-by-side model is that friendships or friends, excuse me, um, are not focused on outer trappings. They're not focused on outer trappings. So if you're side by side, you're looking out in a way. You're not focused on yourself or all that goes into self. Lewis says this, friendship, unlike Eros, is is uninquisitive. You become a man's friend without knowing or caring whether he's married or single or how he earns his living. What have all these unconcerning things or matters of fact to do with the real question, do you see the same truth? In a circle of true friends, each man is simply what he is. Stands for nothing but himself. No one cares two pence about anyone else's family, profession, class, income, race, or previous history. (coughs) Of course, you will get to know about most of these in the end. But casually, they will come out bit by bit to furnish an illustration or an analogy, to serve as pegs for an anecdote, but never for their own sake. And this is such a great quote. That is the kingliness of friendship. Eros will have naked bodies, friendship, naked personalities. Um, And in our sinful nature, we want to make friendship about the outer outer trappings that another person can offer us. It's just what we do as women. And I caught myself, this was probably about four or five years ago. And I was, it was, or my kids were doing summer swim team. And I saw a friend of mine I hadn't seen in a long time and 
you know, I've known her since elementary school, actually, and, but I hadn't seen her in a while. And, and I, I found myself, my first questions to her, and as women, if you tune in, where do you live? Where do your kids go to school? Um, I mean, you might as well, what kind of car do you drive? Uh, can I see your bank account? I mean, sometimes that's what we're saying, you know? And to catch yourself and say, am I interested in this person's outer trappings or am I interested in the truth of this person's heart? And to close your mouth and to keep your, and to really, then all of a sudden you find your, what you're really like. Am I that shallow? You know? Or do I have other things that interest me and that I want to ask someone about? Their heart, where they are, you know? Um, and to, but just to watch that in ourselves and in me, I have to watch that in me as women, as a woman. I was listening to a lecture series on the seven deadly sins, which was really fun, um, <laughs> by Dr. Carla Waterman. She was a professor of mine when I was at Wheaton. I spent a year at Wheaton College in Illinois, and uh, she's an amazing, wise, wise woman. And she said this, and this is on your outline. Um, and we've talked about this a little bit in Waiting for Beauty, but in our sinful nature, people can either become trophies on our walls or art dealers to market us to a watching world. True friendship loves someone for their own sake, not what they can give you. The more you and I love Jesus, the less we will use people to be trophies on our walls or art dealers. Jesus never used people, ever. He loved them for their own sake. And he laid his life down. And when you walk with him, he will change you. He will begin to monitor your speech. He'll begin to monitor your motives. He'll begin to help you become a good friend, right? And the fourth thing with this side-by-side image is that friends are defined by wisdom and humility. Wisdom and humility. In other words, friendship in your life should be marked by and defined by wisdom and humility, not by other things. And if you are truly not using people as, as art dealers, loving them for their own sake, if you're not jealous, if you're absorbed in a common interest side by side, it means you're going to be, your friendships will be defined by wisdom and humility. Listen, I, James 3, 13 through 18, says it so powerfully. And this, this was before I had kids. I was, we had been married for a few years, and I was just experiencing some strife and some friendships and some jealousy and some envy, and the Lord took me to this passage. And I mean, it was like, have you ever felt God like jerk your hair back? Like, like a you know, spank almost, you listen to me, young woman, um, and just peeled back the layers of my heart. Um, and he did it in a kind way. It was gracious. But this is what this passage did for me. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who who make peace. This really is a beautiful summary of friendship. Um, and as you, as you read this passage, it's, it's, just, it's a good heart check to ask yourself, how are your friendships defined? Because there are two ways we can go here. Um, this is good spiritual hygiene. Okay, but First, are, are, are your friendships and the way that you walk through life with other women pure? Peaceable, gentle, reasonable? Are you willing to yield and concede to another to be humble? Or do you always have to be right? Are you, um, do you rejoice, right, in, in, when they're, in their success? Or are you envious and, and um, jealous? 
Are you full of mercy? Do you give lots of grace? Is there good fruit? Are you unwavering? Are you, is it up one day and bad another and without hypocrisy? <coughs> or are your relationships or friendships defined most often through bitter jealousy and selfish ambition that is earthly, natural, and demonic? And I so wish I could, again, go back to my junior high self, or I so wish I could tell I have four girls. I'm like, oh, how are we going to get through um, all the way through high school with four girls? Um, if I could just transfer, put in them what I, what I know now, that it never ends well, ever. When you have jealousy or, bitter, or selfish ambition, or gossip in your heart. It just doesn't. Or pride. Check yourself, right? It's just going to end in a bad way. Humility is always best. It's always best. Um, and so it's not, you know, of course, and friendships and as women, we're, there, we are, we're, n- we're never going to be perfect, right? Who can keep his whole person? Who can keep his tongue in check all the time? But as a trend, okay, as the majority of the time, how are your relationships defined? And if it's always someone else's fault or someone else's issue, then it's your issue. Don't be deceived. As James says, don't be arrogant and lie against the truth. Be strong enough to look at yourself and your friendships as they really are. Not through what you want them to be or it's so-and-so's fault or through the lens of your jealousy, competition, or selfish ambition. And before we go any further, just to share a personal example, the Lord really began to deal with this issue in my heart about six or seven years ago. And it started with Christmas cards. I was putting them on a ring, you know, so we could pray for different families, and I just started noticing my inner commentary. Um, Like, oh, she's not very nice, or so-and-so hurt my feelings, or that, that, that. And I, and I caught myself. Do you ever do that? You're like, what am I doing? And I just, I started praying. I, I realized every time I would see someone and I had a funny feeling in my heart or a judgmental spirit or criticism or an unforgiveness or whatever, I would, I would stay on that card and pray through it until I felt like God had dealt with the junk that was in my heart. And that's how it started. It ended about six months later with an explosive argument with my husband, Caroline, who's now seven and a half, was about one. And he said, relationships or friendships with you are about a three or a four when they could be a nine or a 10. He says, with you, it's always someone else's fault. And I, it was like, and praise God, it was, it was so hard to hear. It was so hard to hear, but it, it sent me into about a six month to a year journey of getting real and right in my relationships to say, okay, enough is enough. I can either this trajectory that I'm on of it's always someone else's fault and it's always hard. And I've, I'm so, um, demanding of myself. I can be that way with my friends and expect perfection, or I can start to give grace and Praise God for a husband who is willing to call me out and to say, out of love, this could be so much better, you know? And my circle got smaller and I had to have a lot of hard conversations and humble. It was like, you know, humbling myself a lot. It put me in a season of real repentance and humility and going back to people I had wronged. Um, And people, most people were so much kinder to myself, to me than I am to myself, you know? But, and my circle got smaller, but it also got truer and freer with the Lord to where now when I get Christmas cards, praise God, you can send me your cards. I will not judge you. Um, There is just such freedom. You know what I mean? Like freedom. And it was such a blessing. Um, So, and, and what I saw was, and, and what the Lord has taught me is so often when we are having issues with our friends, it's not about them. It's about us, right? It's about, it's about us with the Lord because we can never give to someone else. We have not received first from him. 
And it was so sweet because last weekend, or it was just, I just have had a hard, of course, the week that I teach on friendship, it's always, you know, a, tr- a test or a trial. You kind of have to go through it. And it's just been a week of just sort of beating myself up for failures. You know, like, oh, if I only I had done this, or only I had been this kind of friend, or, you know, just, you know, and, and missing the redemption and the grace of God. And on my desk on Monday morning, my nine-year-old daughter, Lizzie, I, I got my cup of coffee and I went to my desk, and this was on my desk. And it says, loved, live like you're loved. And she said, you are so loved, Mommy, so live like you know that I love you and that God loves you. I love you, Lizzie. And the Lord used that. I mean, I was like, Lizzie, what, where did that come from? She's like, I don't know. I just made it for you. But the Lord was like, that is the problem with all of our friendships. When I can't receive that I really am loved, despite all my flaws, despite that inner voice that knows we just mess up on a daily basis, when I can't receive that grace and forgiveness from the Lord, how in the world am I going to offer it to other people, right? It always goes back to our friendship with others and that critical voice we have or that self-pity that we have, or that inability to offer forgiveness, or whatever it is, it goes back to an inability to receive the unconditional forgiveness and friendship of God. That's where it goes. And so here's the good news. What is the focal point of friendship? Because the tendency is, oh, I've made such a mess of things. How do I even start? And you just start going around trying to untangle all the knots in the rope. You know, like we have all these knots and all these, uh, how, where do we even start? And the great thing is you don't start with the knots. You just, you just start with the Lord and you hand it to him. And as he begins to heal your heart and as you work on this vertical part, he gets the knots out. Now he might, you might have to have some tough conversations with some people. You might have to go do a lot of humbling or repenting. But he gets the knots out as you focus on him. And John 15 says this. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of my Father, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. And verse 12 is on your outline. This is my commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. And this is the focal point behind every friendship for the Christ follower, right? It's always Christ. We cannot love one another unless we know that we are receiving the love of Christ as he loves us. And yes, this, our common interest can be about other things. It can be about writing or reading or tennis or child rearing or white mice or dominoes. But Christ is always the direction and the focus and the sustaining force behind it. And this is the next thing on your outline. The quality of our friendship with others will always flow from the strength of our friendship with Christ. Always. Our relationship and friendship with others, particularly with other women, I think, are really like litmus tests. They show or indicate what's going on in our relationship with the Lord. And again, it goes back to we cannot give to others what we're not receiving ourselves. If all we feel like we're getting from the Lord is vinegar, we hear that voice of failure or, um, you know, or we're not, we're not sitting still long enough to rest in his presence, then all we're going to pour out is vinegar. We have to receive the oil and, and, and the, the wine and the redemptive healing, nurturing, nourishing fragrance of his presence in our lives in order to be good friends to others. So that's the good news. That's the good news. 
Because when Christ is our focus, we, then we can be selfless, getting from him, so we can give to others regardless of what we get in return. We're not jealous or focused on outer trappings. Others are not trophies on our walls or art dealers for our houses. We're humble and wise because we're walking with wisdom himself and have himself to give to others. And it makes for the best kind of friendships. So I want to talk about friendships gone awry. We're going to role play. I need four people to come up, four volunteers here. We're just going to um, do a little demonstration so anyone can come. Okay, come on. Yes, Marissa and Julie, Jenny. Shall we? Oh, I got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sweet Sarah. All right, so we have four friends here. All right, so here's our model. Four people side by side, right? The focal point is Christ. You're looking outwards. This is a fighting force and a battle line, all right? You pray together. You advance together. You you um, hurt and laugh together, okay? But this is when friendship goes awry. And this is on your outline, scenario one, bent creatures. All right, get in a circle. You bend. You don't, you're not in a fighting line anymore. You just get in a little holy huddle. All right, and you bend. Okay. <laughs> okay, you can stand up. You can stand up. All right, so we're created to stand up straight with our eyes fixed on Christ. But when we bend, Romans 1, we worship the created rather than the creator, and you can't see common interests or truth. All you see is yourself. And this is why my husband says in our flesh, he says, women hate women. And he's right. We do. Because we're operating out of a bent position with our eyes turned inward on ourselves, not on the Lord. And in this bent position, we promote ourselves and we're looking for others to control who will promote us too. And it breathes this concept of the inner circle, okay, that no one else can get into. But what inner circle? A headless inner circle, you know, and where everyone's trying to vie to be the center And what I have found, I've never met a woman who says, yes, I am in the inner circle. Even if you're like, you are so in the inner circle. (laughs) It's a myth, okay? No one ever thinks that they are. No one feels like it. And so um, what you do is you, well, I'm not going to give to the the remedy about it. But you can be this way and bent in this inner circle thing. You can be aggressive and sanguine and loud about it. Or you can be quiet and shy and withdraw so people are always saying, what's wrong? Did I do something wrong? Are you okay? Right? That's kind of my, um, my tendency. But both people are trying to be at the center. Both are bent and both are serving and worshiping self. Okay, scenario two, independent creatures. Okay, so you three are side by side. You can even hook arms here. And then Sarah, you're by yourself. You just cross your arms. Okay. <laughs> She's the island, all right? Um, So this is scenario number two, independent creatures. So you can have bent creatures, you can have independent creatures. So we can do this quietly or with jocularity. We're always talking and moving and joking so no one gets too close. But there's no need to lean on anybody because that's what shoulders are for, right? To lean on. And you're still looking at Christ, but you're at a distance from others. And um, I don't, I'm not a counselor. I haven't read this or know this for certain, but I think that this Independence is a protective stance that's bred from fear. It's a fear of becoming dependent on other people. And I think that it can be, come from two different places. I think it can come from woundedness, fear of rejection. If you were wounded once and you're determined, I'm never going to be left alone again. So I'm just going to go ahead and isolate myself so that option isn't there anymore. Or it comes from a fear of losing control. They're only in relationships with people where they are in control, um, where others have to lean on them, but you don't ever have to yourself do the leading. And it's just an unhealthy way to live, right? Again, it's an inward independent focus. You're, you're dependent on yourself, which is a wretched place to be. Um, and it goes against the image of the Godhead in you, right? We need equals, not just those who can, can we can control or who need us. So, Um, Like Lewis said, having anyone to yourself means you have less of him. Meaning, if you're determined to live life by yourself, you're going to even have less of yourself. Because you need others to draw out the fullness of who you are. 
So, scenario number three. All right. Okay, Marissa and Jenny, put your arms um, on each other's shoulders. Okay, this is scenario number three. Codependent creatures. Okay, and Julie and Sarah, are, can y'all get in? Can you just try to get in? Please, okay. I want to be your friend. Please. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay, so in codependency, two people are trying to possess each other to the exclusion of everyone else. Y'all can put your arms down. I know that's not super comfortable looking in each other's eyes. Okay, so y'all can sit down. Thank you. So those are our three scenarios. Bent, independent, or codependent. And I think as women, those are our sort of three default positions that we go to the most. And in codependency, um, again, it takes the focus off of the common interest, and you lose the ability to become interesting to anybody else but each other. And while it's sometimes painful for those who are trying to get in, in reality, the codependent people are, are the ones at a loss because, again, in having that person to yourself, you have less of that person. You have less of that person. You have a small, limited view of yourself and that other person. And you're no longer a fighting force, but you're disconnected from the body. And it comes dangerously close to idolatry, idolatry, right? It's a holy huddle of two people. Um, And eventually, this person loses her fascination, just like in a romantic relationship, and you have to move on to find someone else to possess. And usually, these relationships end in incredibly messy, painful ways. Um, This is just a guess, my own guess, but probably the average woman has been in about three to four codependent relationships by the time we're 30, right? So good questions to ask yourself. You know, if someone else spends time with your friend or goes to lunch with your friend or plays tennis with your friend or whatever, are you okay with that? What comes up in your heart? Are you okay to be with this person around other people too? Or do you always want to possess her to the exclusion of others? Do you consistently create situations where that other person needs you financially or emotionally? Are you okay when that other person doesn't need you? Are you okay with being in situations or groups on your own without this person? Um, And maybe this isn't your particular struggle, or you used to struggle with this but don't need more. Um, But we either used to be like that or are like that, or we know someone like that, and it's easy to judge someone like that, or we have a daughter like that. Um, And if you're like me, you can sort of have one tendency to be bent, independent, or codependent, or you can like be all three at the same time in different relationships. Um, but we're all daughters of Eve. So we all struggle, every single one of us. Every single one of us in our flesh tends towards one of these bent, codependent, independent scenarios. So let's close with what is needed. What do you need for the bent person? This is on your outline. To straighten up. For the bent person to straighten up. Nothing happens without repentance. It's the first step for any change. And it's kind of ironic because repentance is the first step of straightening up, right? You get low, you humble yourself in order to stand up straight. It's saying, Lord, you are God and I am not. And it's what repentance is, is declaring that you yourself are not enough anymore. And instead of looking down and in, you look up and out. And you let the Lord be the center. And you let him call the shots. And the best piece of advice I can give you, again, is don't, if you find yourself in this bent relationship, these bent friendship, bent position with friendships and vying to be the center and using people um, with yourself as the focus, don't just try to start undoing the knots. That's just remaining bent, you know? You stand up straight and you look at the Lord and you hand him the rope with the knots. You ask him for wisdom and humility and he'll untangle the mess you've made. He will make you the friend he wants you to become and bring the friends that he wants you to have. And we have to let go of this inner circle mentality. Again, I don't know of a woman who thinks she's on the inner circle side, even if we all, the rest of us think she is, right? You start grasping for a group and you stand up straight. And I love my friend Lee McElroy said, stop seeing life as an as a um, destination and start seeing it as an embarkation. 
She said, who are your traveling companions and what do I take in my heart from here? I love that. You stand up straight. This is not a destination. This is an embarkation. This is a journey. It's like what we talked about in healing. We're pilgrims with the Lord. Who are my traveling companions that God wants to bring? What do I take in my heart from here? And I think sometimes we, we hang on the fringes of a group or relationships or we sometimes we see that other women are bent or we feel like there's this vine for this inner circle um, and we stand back and we think, oh, I would love to be friends with that person, but she already has her group or that, uh, that person's so established. I promise you, every woman feels alone no matter how surrounded she looks, you know? At, at different points in her life. And if you, every, she, whoever you are, if you're new to a city, if you're new to a school, if you're new to a situation, there are people there who need you as their friend. And don't hang back. The Lord can create intimacy and depth and bonds and friendship in a moment. That's happened to every single one of us in here where you meet someone and it's like you have years because God can do in a moment through his spirit what can take decades for people, right? So you be confident and know I'm not going to try to get in some sort of circle or vibe for relationships. I'm going to be the woman who God has called me to be and trust he's going to bring the traveling companions that I need in this season of life and trust that there are women who need me as their friend as well. God has those and he will forge those relationships and those friendships beautifully in ways that we could never even imagine or come up with. For the independent person, this is on your outline, what is needed is to put our arms down and to link up with one another. Again, it begins with repentance. Confront your fears. You know, perfect love casts out all fears and let the Lord begin to undo your fear. And I think for the the independent person, whether you're independent from wounding or wanting to maintain control, which is usually because of wounding, you know, that I think the most important thing to know is that when dealing with fear and not wanting to ever lean on someone else is that you have to learn that the Lord himself is safe to lean upon and to walk with. He may not always do safe things, but who he is and his character and himself as a friend is always safe. There is one time in the gospels where Jesus describes himself like his inner character. And it's Matthew 11, 28 through 30. And he says, I am what? Gentle and humble of heart. Gentle. Isn't that who you want as a friend? Like if you could paint a friend, you'd say, I want them to be gentle and humble of heart, right? That is who he is. He is safe for you to walk with. He is a safe place for you to link up with and lean on and to dwell. And as you do that with him, your walls can come down. And he will enable you to do that with other people. Um, So, number three, for the codependent person, what is needed is to face forward. Face forward. And again, begin with repentance. The repentance of idolatry. Ask the Lord for forgiveness for worshiping the created rather than the creator. And for putting that friend in his place. And then, and then this is really important. I remember um, having to do this as, as a teenager a number of times. So if you have or, or are involved with teenage girls and you see this, they're trying to find their significance or lean too heavily on a friend and saying, hey, sweetie, you know, you will never find, you're trying to worship the created rather than the creator. And then praying and asking God to break any tie that they've put or that you've put in someone else that should only be a tie or a connection to him. And, and that detaching or a time of separation can occur that will most likely be painful. And the cool thing is, is he usually has a way when you say, Lord, I need to get out of this relationship. This is unhealthy. He has these really amazing ways of doing that for you. Someone will move or change school or whatever. Um, and then there's usually a time of just kind of loneliness or separation and that's okay. For this, for if you are a codependent person or are helping someone who's a codependent person, being okay with it, just being you and the Lord for a season, right? My grandmother sent me a card in college 
Loneliness is our friend when it forces you to enjoy the fellowship of God as much as you would the fellowship of another. And when you, you start walking out of relationships that aren't healthy, he's going to teach you how to have healthy relationships first by being healthy with him. So whether you are bent or independent or codependent, when you repent of pride or selfish ambition or fear or idolatry and you hand God the knots and you ask him to begin to make you the friend you want to become, know that that season of loneliness, no matter which one you are, will probably ensue. And that's okay. That's normal. It's a season of intimacy with himself where he is making you into the person he wants you to be. And your focal point becomes Christ. Um, and I, as you learn to receive from him first, then you can give to others. I love George MacDonald was a 19th century pastor from Scotland. And he wrote, um, he wrote a lot of things, but he wrote this little poem. And he says, why is it that so often I return from social converse with a spirit worn? A lack, a disappointment, even a sting of shame as for some low, unworthy thing. Because I have not careful, first of all, set my door wide open back to the wall. Ere at others' doors did knock and call. What he's saying is this. So often we enter into relationships or social situations, particularly with women or big groups with, uh, with others, and we leave feeling like we're ashamed or we didn't do it right or we didn't say it right or our friendships are a mess or whatever and he says it's because first I tried to enter into relationships with others without grounding myself securely with my back against the door of Christ and more and more as we learn to ground ourselves in him we will be okay and confident to walk into any situation any room not focused on the outer trappings of others you know not caring about what we have on or what others have on or um, our accomplishments or lack of accomplishments, but being okay to be the woman he's created us to be because our friendship with him is secure and therefore we can enter into confidently friendship with others. And learning to be okay, the older I get, more I'm learning to be okay with who God's made me to be. And it's making me a better friend, you know? I, some of you have heard me say this before, but a couple years ago, Jason was like, no offense, but if I'm planning a girl's trip, trip and on the beach, um, I'm not thinking about, you're not like the first one on my list to be next to me with a fruity drink with an umbrella in it. He's like, now, if I want to talk to someone about something or need counseling or prayer, you're my girl. You know, because I was, like, disappointed that I hadn't been included in something. He's like, babe, just be who you are. It's okay. And so just growing, the older I get, the more I'm like, you know what? If you want a party planned, do not ask me. If you want a room mom, don't ask me. And you know what? I'm not asked. That's okay. You know? If you want a devotional written for the party, I'm your girl, okay? But just like letting go of who you're not and being who you are. Because who you are is so needed. It's so needed. And who your other friends are, you know, they're needed in your life. And I think that is, it's setting your back firmly against the wall, so to speak, against the door of who Christ made you to be. And letting go of the rest. Um, on your outline, if others around you, as you start to grow in this journey, and as you start to become more whole and free to be side by side and absorbed in a common interest and in growing into the woman God's called you to be, but others around you are still bent or independent or codependent, it can become tricky, right? Because we all grow different ways, different seasons, different times. And what I've learned is focus on Christ, and, and it says, but love your sister. It should say, and love your sister. Focus on Christ and love your sister. Some friendships are worth fighting for. Not all, but some. And, and what I would say is, 
if you if you sense as you're growing and, and there's always in different seasons of life in different relationships if you're if certain friendships are hard fight first choose to fight first and then step out of the battle for a season if it's clear that it's not working because i can i can honestly say this that i regret the ones i did not fight for i regret the ones i did not fight for some i fought for and it just didn't work and that's okay but some i stepped out of the arena far too early I stopped loving and I started judging and I missed out. I missed out. Don't, as my, as my husband says, don't kick her to the curb in your heart. Pray for your friend and wait on God's timing, right? For the prayers of a righteous man availeth much and faithful are the wounds of a friend. And focus on becoming the friend you know your friend needs to have or that you need to become. And the second thing on your outline, pray for mercy and forgiveness in your heart towards her. Look for opportunities to reconcile. You know, don't talk about it with others. That just, in, that just doesn't, for lots of reasons. Most often it turns into gossip. But pour out your, wa- your heart before the Lord. He can handle your emotions. And as you think about your friend, know that you used to be in that exact same place and you could be again one day. And as the Lord prompts you um, to move, make a move towards that person, do it. You know, if he puts, puts her on your heart, pray for her, text her, call her. <laughs> and if you, when you start feeling that wall build, actively do things to tear it down. I think as women, we so often, and I think I, 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 can, I feel things so, so much. It's just kind of how I'm wired. I can walk into a room and I can automatically feel walls. You know, there's just certain walls with certain people. And I'm finding how to actively tear them down. Make a move towards that person. Reach out. Because our tendency is to withdraw. At least mine is. Um, but as the Lord leads, as he prompts you, um, move towards that person. Get outside of yourself in love and in mercy and in grace. And the last thing on your outline, develop a spirit of thankfulness for your friends of gratitude. You know, it's kind of like with my kids. Um, people joke with, joke with Jason and I. They're like, your kids will eat anything. They'll eat salmon. They'll eat asparagus. And, and I don't know why, but I just, when we had kids, I was like, you will eat what's in front of you. They're allowed one gag food. I mean, there's like one legitimate, like they throw up if they eat that. Fine, but you get one, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, you're eating it. And it was just something in me about showing gratitude at the table. For whatever is put in front of you, give thanks. Eat. And I feel like that with friends as women. So often we sit down at the table that God has provided for us, the friends that God has put around us, and we say, but I don't like that about her. I want a different kind of friend. I need this friend to be this to me, or I need this in that season. When God is saying, be thankful, you're not the one who sets the meal. I am. Be thankful for who I put in front of you. Now, are there seasons where he's going to, like if you're in a, a, if you've chosen to be with a group of friends that are not helping you towards holiness and a love of the Lord, then that's one thing. But if it's just that we're just being picky and jealous and manipulative and unthankful or discontent as women, which is so often where we can be, develop an attitude of thankfulness. For right where God has put you, with the friends he's given you in the season that you're in. Lewis says this, and this is my favorite quote, um, and it's on your outline. In friendship, we think we have chosen our peers. In reality, a few years difference in the date of our birthdays, a few more miles between certain houses, the choice of one university instead of another, posting to different regiments, the accident of a topic being raised or not raised at a first meeting, any of these chances might have kept us apart. But for a Christian, there are, strictly speaking, no chances. A secret master of the ceremonies has been at work. Christ, who said to the disciples, "Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friends, you have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you, for one another. The friendship is not a reward for our discrimination, 
and good taste in finding one another out. It is the instrument by which God reveals to each the beauties of all the others. There are no greater be- there, they are no greater than the beauties of a thousand other men. By friendship, God opens our eyes to them. They are, like all beauties, derived from him, and then in a good friendship, increased by him through friendship itself, so that it is his instrument for creating as well as for revealing. At this feast, it is he who has spread the board, and it is he who has chosen the guests. It is he, we may dare to hope, who sometimes does and always should preside. Let us not reckon without our host. Friends are great gifts from the Lord to not only, they help you understand who you are, they help you get outside of, they help us get outside of ourselves and appreciate things that are common interests. And most of all, they help us love Christ more himself. Because I cannot, just as we cannot know um, each other without having people around us, because we all bring out different aspects of each other, so it is with Christ. I can, there are certain aspects of Christ I cannot understand without certain friends. I cannot understand the nurture of Christ without Jenny Binghouse. I cannot understand the hospitality of Christ without my friend Kimberly Roth. I cannot understand the goodness and the gentleness of Christ without my brother Taylor. I cannot understand the joy of Christ without my sister-in-law Kara. I cannot understand the forgiveness of Christ without Robin. There are just things I cannot understand about Christ unless I see them through my friends. There are certain friends God has put in your life. It's not about you. It's about him. It's not about me. It's about him. And it's learning to walk in this relationship with him where we are willing to um, receive with a grateful heart what he has to give us, not just in the friends he gives us, but about the things he wants to teach us about himself. And so the great news that today is, if you're a woman, if we are women, which we all are women in here, we've messed up in friendships. We just have. We've been bent. We've been independent. We've been codependent, sometimes all at the same time. But the great news is, is it's not up to us to figure it out or to fix it. Our job is to humble ourselves, is to get low before the Lord, And then be willing to get low before other people to make it right where we need to. And then to walk with wisdom himself. Walk with Jesus day in and day out, keeping our walls down actively. And in humility, enjoying and loving well the people he brings in our paths. And I'm so thankful to just be a little bit beyond you know, a little bit further down the road with each passing year, able to appreciate friends more, able to be more content with who God made me to be, and able to um, turn the failures over to him and say, Lord, this is just another chance for you to redeem, for you to redeem. So let's close on prayer. I want to just um, kind of pray through each of the three scenarios quickly, and then we'll um, stop in time for small groups. But Father, thank you so much for for the gift of friendship. It is how the universe was made. This this beautiful friendship within the Trinity and the joy between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You could be just one God with just one part, but you're one God with three parts because friendship and fellowship and intimacy is so Um, It's perfection. It's how you are. Therefore, it's how we want to be. So, Lord, I pray that um, areas in our lives where we need to grow as friends, we would not hear this message with any sort of condemnation, but with invitation. You are saying, um, come be the woman I've called you to be. Father, if any of us in here are bent 
I pray in, in, in worshiping ourselves and nitpicking ourselves to death and trying to be in this inner circle, God, I, I just ask that we would stand up straight and look at you, worship you freely, become who you've called us to be, and receive the people you want to bring as friends. Father, I pray that if any of us in here are independent, we have isolated ourselves from needing friends who are our equals to lean on and pray with and live with and laugh and love with, that we would humble ourselves through repentance and that you would um, cast out all of our fears. You are so safe to walk with. You will never crush our hearts. You heal our hearts. And that we can trust the people that you bring into our lives are those that you um, mean for us to link up with. And you will keep our hearts safe as we walk with you. And Father, for those of us in here who are codependent, who have, who have put too much emphasis and focus and significance in another person who is just frail human flesh like we are, we repent. If we have been jealous and tried to exclude others from being in relationship with a friend, we repent. We pray that we would put our arms down and look to you and that in any time of, or season of loneliness that would ensue, you would show us how to walk in friendship with you. And you would make us strong so that we can link up with one another, Lord. And I pray that um, you would be our wisdom. Above all things, you would be our wisdom. And I ask for each woman in this room and um, that for each woman who does this study that you would provide friends fighting and a fighting force and a fighting line to do life with together in whatever season we are in. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you laid your life down for us as your friends. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.